Welcome to the second unit of the course on Bayesian probability theory. My name is Wolfgang von der Linden and I will enable you to help Captain Bayes and her crew to solve the questions regarding the golden Nautilus wheel. The aim of this unit is to derive probabilities from experiments, which we will call the frequentist approach and which in this story is represented by Captain Venn. The law of large numbers will be the central message that explains the link between intrinsic probabilities and sample estimates. Furthermore, we extend the probabilistic language and investigate probability distributions and introduce quantities to characterize them. Before we discuss probability distributions and samples, let us first review the findings of the last unit and apply them to the recent adventure of Captain Base to the Golden Nautilus Wheel. The Golden Nautilus Wheel has four segments for the four possible tasks of the day. These segments represent the outcomes of the random experiment and form the sample space omega. Do you remember the concept of random variables and how we can define them? In principle, you have to assign a number to each outcome. The number that is natural in this example is the number of pennies which is rewarded for each task of the day. So the range of the random variable in this example is 1, 3, 4 and 6. Now the outcomes are represented on the abscissa and we can plot the corresponding probabilities derived by Bernoulli on the ordinate. Remember that probabilities add up to 1. The diagram depicting probabilities over the random variable is called probability mass function and is one way to illustrate a discrete probability distribution. Depending on the order in which we assign the outcomes to real numbers, we obtain different probability distributions. To complete the review of the last unit, remember the generalization of outcomes to events, which allows us to formulate questions like what is the probability for sailing or fishing? The new concept in this unit is sampling. Captain Venn repeats the experiment of the Golden Nautilus wheel a hundred times and collects a sample of the experiment, which is in principle an array of outcomes. To indicate samples and the finite character of a measured array of outcomes, we use boldface letters and Greek indices throughout this course. A good representation of such a sample is a histogram, which indicates how often an outcome occurred. Note that different samples lead to different histograms, which can vary significantly, as can be seen in this case with sample size 24. For a large sample size, for instance 1000, the intersample variation is less, and the individual diagrams resemble more the intrinsic probability mass function that we discussed before. This brings us to the frequentist approach of how to define the probability of an outcome, namely by the relative frequency of its occurrence in the limit of an infinite sample size. An interesting question, which will be partly answered by the law of large numbers, is the following. How well is the intrinsic probability approximated by the relative frequency of a finite size sample? Before discussing the law of large numbers, we enhance our language in probability theory and introduce parameters that are suited to characterize probability distributions. To be more specific, we first introduce two different distributions, which we encounter again in the next units. The binomial distribution that describes the probability for the number k of successes in a binary experiment repeated independently n times. The binomial distribution depends on two parameters, the number of repetitions n and the success probability q in a single experiment. Depending on these parameters, the peak centers, also called locations, change, and so does the width of the peak. Note that this distribution has a quite symmetric form about its center. The second example is given by the Poisson distribution. 
it provides the probability for finding k observations of an event in a fixed time or space interval. Here the average count in that interval is known to be lambda. The Poisson distribution occurs very often in nature, especially in the context of counting experiments, like the number of meteorites striking the Earth in a year or the number of photons emitted by a bulb per second. In the following slides we will now learn about the characteristic parameters that will give us important information about the distribution. We will introduce them from two points of view, namely Bernoulli's view of intrinsic features and Venn's perspective of repeated experiments. This shall help you to make the link between the two worlds. Note that the characteristic values obtained from samples are themselves random variables, whereas the characteristic values from the intrinsic probabilities are fixed numbers. We will use a slightly different notation and wording to distinguish them. The mean value, also called expectation value, describes the location of a distribution. Based on the intrinsic probabilities, the intrinsic mean is a fixed number given by the weighted sum of the random variable using the probabilities as weights. One can also calculate the mean of functions of random variables, like x squared. We denote the intrinsic mean by angle brackets. Note that the mean is linear. We will study this property in some minutes. From the frequentist perspective, based on a sample of size n, the sample mean is formed by the arithmetic mean of the sample values. Note that the sample mean varies depending on the sample and describes a random variable. The sample mean will be denoted by an overline. Now we turn to the first part of the law of large numbers. It states that the sample mean converges to the intrinsic mean when the sample size n approaches infinity. From this relation we can also derive the frequentist definition of probabilities, namely as relative frequencies in the limit of infinitely large sample size. Another parameter characterizing the location of a distribution is the median. It is that value of a random variable or the ordered sample set that splits them into two halves, each containing at least 50% of the probability masses or number of elements. Let us illustrate the intrinsic median for the golden nautilus wheel. We need to add up the probabilities in the order of the random variables and stop when we reach or exceed the 50% mark for the first time. We see 11 plus 17 is still below the 50% threshold, but 11 plus 17 plus 28 exceeds it, and so the third value of x, namely 4 pennies, is the median. In the precise definition, we also have to sum up the probabilities from right to left. For the Nautilus wheel, we obtain 45 plus 28, which is greater than 50, so the median is again the third value of x. The median is not unique if the cumulative probability reaches precisely 50%. For the sample median, one has to order the sample first and then take the central value. If the sample size is even, one takes either both central values or the average of both, which in our example is 4 pennies. In contrast to the mean, the median is resilient against outliers. A single erroneous measurement can severely distort the sample mean, while the sample median remains unchanged. Besides the location of a distribution, the width is also of great importance. It is characterized by the variance, which is the mean squared deviation of the random variable from its mean. Now this definition may fall from the sky but we will discuss fascinating properties of the variance that makes it so powerful. We see from the definition that the variance has squared units. In order to characterize the width of a distribution, we therefore use the square root of the variance, which is called standard deviation and which is denoted by sigma. The variance, therefore, is often labeled with sigma squared.
Note that not all values of the distribution have to lie inside the so-called one sigma interval given by the mean value plus or minus the standard deviation. Let us now consider the frequentist approach. Given a sample of size n, we can pursue the very same strategy and characterize the width of the sample by the mean squared deviation. The question is, how does the sample variance relate to the true variance? There are two things to take into account. First, we assume that the individual samples are uncorrelated, meaning that the repeated experiments do not influence each other. For a counterexample, just think of a random wheel that is pushed so weakly that it barely moves. Then you get correlated samples, in which in most cases successive elements are identical. The second point to be accounted for is that we actually do not know the true mean, but only an estimate given by the sample mean. Therefore, the unbiased sample variance that estimates the true variance is given by the sum of the squared deviations from the sample mean divided by n minus 1. The meaning of the notion unbiased will be discussed in a later unit. The minus 1 in the prefactor can be understood qualitatively as we have used the sample already to compute the sample mean. By doing so, the number of independent deviations, x sub i minus sample mean, is reduced by 1. By now we have learned the two most important characteristics of probability distributions, namely mean and variance. To deepen our understanding, let's now look at how to use these quantities. The weighted average of the kth power of a random variable x, where the weights are given by the probabilities, is a recurring structure and it is named the kth moment and is denoted by m sub k. The kth moment is equivalent to the mean of x to the power k. We can now readily identify the mean as the first moment, but what is the zeros moment? It is the sum of all probabilities and therefore always one. Finally, the second moment can be calculated directly by substituting x to the power 2 into the expression for the mean. We now practice how we can use the moments to derive a useful relation for the variance. The variance is given as the mean of the squared deviations from the intrinsic mean, which is also called the second central moment. Expanding the squared deviations according to the simple binomial theorem results in a sum of three terms. Due to the linearity, the mean of a sum is the sum of the means. We use the fact that already averaged quantities, such as the mean, are scalar factors that can be drawn out of the angle brackets. Finally, we obtain the elegant relationship that the variance is the difference between the second moment and the squared first moment. Similarly, it's straightforward to compute the kth moment based on a sample. By the same proof, we also obtain the useful relation that the sample variance is given by the second sample moment minus the first moment squared. Now, how can we apply the lessons learned to help Captain Bayes to answer the questions concerning the wages and the free days ratio, both based on the outcome of the golden spiral experiment? The first question can readily be answered either by using the intrinsic probabilities for the four sectors of the golden spiral, which is Bernoulli's probabilistic approach, or by the statistical description favored by Captain Venn. Bernoulli computes the mean of the distribution that uses pennies as random variables, which results in approximately 4.4 pennies a day. The scatter of the wages is given by the standard deviation sigma which in the present example is 1.66 pennies. A rule of thumb for most distributions is that you can find about two-thirds of all outcomes within the one sigma interval. For the two sigma interval it's roughly 95% and the three sigma interval covers almost 99% of all cases. Captain Venn, on the other hand, determines the mean wages based on a sample. Clearly, these results differ from sample to sample.
Note that the variation of the sample mean depends on the sample size n and it is quantified by the standard deviation of the sample mean, which is also called standard error. If the underlying probability distribution has a finite variance, then the standard error of a sample of size n is given by the intrinsic standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size n. This brings us to the second part of the law of large numbers, which according to the standard error states that with increasing sample size n, the sample mean approaches the intrinsic mean like 1 over square root n. Let's use this insight to answer the second question about the free days ratio in a period of n days. Bernoulli determines the probability of having a day off by using the golden ratio to be 0.106. As you can easily see, this is also the average value of the free days ratio. A similar calculation yields for the standard deviation of the free days ratio a value of 0.307. Remember, Captain Venn admitted that he could not guarantee a free days ratio of at least 10% for a period of a thousand days. To study this point, we repeatedly generate samples of size 1000, compute the sample mean of the free days ratio, and plot the results as histogram. We clearly see that the histogram has a tail that reaches far below the red 10% line, indicating that there is a high probability to have a free days ratio less than the required 10%, corroborating that Captain Wen was right. Next, we repeat the same analysis for samples of size 10,000. Now, there is only a very small tail reaching below the red line. In both cases, the standard error is also included in the histograms indicated by horizontal arrows. Also in this representation, we observe that only in the second case, the 10% free days ratio can be guaranteed with high probability. We have reached the end of the second unit. Get to know the frequentist approach with the interactive simulation. Feel free to ask questions in the forum and feel encouraged to test your knowledge in the quiz.